if the world, and we're going to discover during this conversation, what we can do as a chefs. Uh, do we have enough impact? Can we really do something? Can we be a change to the world? My today's guests are Gita Bansal, former university professor, autodidactic chef, restaurateur, cancer survivor, food writer, often appearing on TV and radio and speaking at gastronomic events. In 2018, she launched a game-changing culinary platform, Salty, her inde independent quarterly magazine. Hi, Gita. Hi. Nice to have you here. With me in this discussion room is also Emma Bengtsson, the, who spent first four years of her career at the only Michelin two-star restaurant in Sweden at that time, discovering her love for pastry. Through other professional experiences, she became the executive chef of the New York's acclaimed Aquavit restaurant in 2014. Hi, Emma. <laughs> Nice to meet you. We also have uh, Margot Janse, who has a long experience with South African top restaurants and introduced tasting menus to South Africa when she created the tasting room within the Ciro Molinaros. In 2009, Margot started Isabello, the charity project which helps children, and this project became her main objective. Hi. And we also have Antonia Klugman, who is the chef and the owner of the Italian Michelin starred restaurant Largin Avenco, located in modern building, contiguous to a 17th century old mill, surrounded by the nature where only eight tables and 20 guests are served, and ingredients are not inanimate objects without roots. Hello, Antonia. Hi. <laughs> it's so nice to have a panel full of uh, superwomen. <laughs> I, I'm really glad that we can talk now uh, about this subject, can chefs save the world in such a companionship? So I would like to start right away with the question to Margot regarding uh, your project, because it's something very, very interesting. You like generally left everything behind you, you did uh, previously and you put your whole heart into this Isabella charity uh, project. Uh, what drove you to that? What was the reason you've started this project? And please elaborate a little bit what this project is about and how it changes the world. Uh, thank you. Um, well, I, I was the chef at Le Cartier Francais in the tasting room for 22 years, since 1995. And um, in 2009, we started doing cooking courses and we decided we needed to do a class that would involve community and um, really for people to help feed the needy. And I think living in South Africa and living on the doorstep of, um, of poverty, um, it's, it's, um, it's in your face every day. So, you, you know, you can wear the kind of the, those horse things, you know, and not, and not look, but... But it's here, and and especially in the small village where I where I live in Franschhoek, um, it's a kilometer to the right. There's severe poverty, and a kilometer to the left was my utopia with the best ingredients and people spending a lot of money on a on a on a dining experience. And so to really kind of bridge that gap, um, we started with just one muffin once a week, and we invited guests to. To, to make that muffin with us for 70 little children. And that was in 2009. And the project grew and it became part of what we did at the tasting room on a daily basis. We made um, warm meals. We started supplying fruit and breakfast. Um, and and um, by the time I left the tasting room, which is three years ago, um, we were feeding 1,300 school children um, every weekday. Um, and I took it with me. Um, and it was never my intention to do it full time. And I, I think that's a very big point. Um, I really feel it needs to be part of what we do on a daily basis. Um, and uh, at the moment, obviously with lockdown, it became a bit more uh, <laughs> all absorbing as it extended from just the children to the, the whole community. Um, and we started feeding a lot more people. But um, I believe we cannot just be busy with extravagance and um, and and super fancy meals when there's so much need and and uh, you know on all levels, not just on food. But for me, children are very close to my heart, and it's not their fault. Uh, and the children are the future, so we need to make sure that they can go to school with food in their tummy, um, so they can concentrate and. Um, 
and become smart. So this is how dining can change somebody's little world day by day on a, on a daily work, work basis or, or school, school day basis. Thank you for sharing this story with us. I would like to go on with, with uh, trying to find out what we can do and what we are doing, what you are already doing in terms of changing the world. I would like to ask uh, Emma, you have two backgrounds. You have the Swedish background, but also you've spent some years uh, in the US uh, already. How do you see both cultures and do you see that uh, the fine dining can change or changes anything in, in any of them, in both of them, how it differs? Well, I think there's a big difference between Sweden and, and US in, in many aspects. And, and something that shocked me a lot moving here was how many people are actually living underneath uh, the poverty line that don't have enough money for food. And that was something I didn't expect to see and something that's considered uh, one of the best countries in the world. So th that for me was something that drove me uh, to do, I can't do everything. And as, as a chef, you even if you would like to save the whole world, I think you gotta have to start locally and, and seek out and see whatever you can do to change the, the future for as many as possible. So what I found that I could do here in New York was get involved with the uh, charities. I work very closely with City Harvest, who's feeding, uh, everyone in New York and new, um, uh, feeding kids, feeding every, everyone that can afford to, to get food. So I think that is something that is, is very uh, do, do, doable for everyone that's here. And, and that is something I never saw until I moved here. And I think the difference when you compare uh, Sweden to US was that food is uh, more accessible and it's something that is not that hard to come by in, in Sweden, mostly because we don't have 350 million people in our little country. So obviously when you do move up into these countries with a massive population, the struggle gets uh, more real. So I think the difference here is that everyone is so in there's so much uh, in need of, of food in the city and and it's not coming in towards everyone so that is what i'm concentrating most of my effort to to be able to get food out to everyone that needs it sure uh, yeah that that might be a problem of of, of the scale as well as as well I'm, I'm talking to you from warsaw so i can more relate to swedish than to u.s situation regarding how what is accessible and uh, what are the actions that are uh, that are, are undertaken by um, various foundations or people who really have a power to to work on on some issues gita you established your Salty magazine where you talk to a lot of chefs. So I would be very interested, what do you get from those discussions and what kind of initiatives, what kind of actions uh, did you hear from those uh, people when you talk to them? Do you have any interesting stories, powerful stories, how the chefs are changing the world? Well, uh, you have uh, two people who have written uh, some beautiful stories, Emma, Antonia, and a lot of other people in the community. Uh, you know, uh, what I've seen in, uh, I've been in the uh, business for about 36 years now, and I've seen uh, uh, the perception of food has changed so much. Uh, food has become like an agent of change. And uh, we, I felt we need that change in our industry as well uh, to provide a platform uh, that is not limited to just those uh, five or six or 10 faces you see everywhere around the world. I wanted to have a place where everybody could bring their point of view, uh, share it, inspire others, uh, you know, stand in solidarity with causes like, uh, you know, uh, what Margot is doing, you know, what she's uh, doing with food is uh, taking it uh, as an agent of change. You know, in the last few years, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about the role of chefs and, uh, you know, now, the very fact that you have chefs on, on a discussion like this 
is because uh, their opinions matter. Uh, they're, uh, you know, they have the power and the ability to speak about things. Uh, they are well informed, uh, not just about food. Uh, they're supposed to be informed about many subjects like sustainability, uh, you know, um, politics of food, everything. And, uh, but everybody has something valuable to say. So we need, we, I felt we need a place where everybody could come from all parts of the world. It doesn't have to be, uh, uh, you know, just uh, somebody who already has that status. Of course, that gives you a power uh, to carry your voice farther and uh, to make it more accessible to others. And uh, I've seen as a result of the magazine from all the comments and the feedback we get, uh, people are, are very inspired by the stories. These are not just the stories of, uh, you know, the big names, uh, you know, the many star chefs who are appearing on Netflix or whatever. It's everybody across the board. It's a young chef, uh, uh, you know, in a country like India, a, a young woman who sets up a business and how she is uh, kind of the underdog and fighting against it, uh, everything, you know, the establishment to take her message forward. It's, a, you know, when Antonia shares her story about dealing with a pandemic, you know, it's, uh, it's very truthful. It's very honest. Uh, you know, Emma writes about, uh, you know, finding her place in the world, uh, you know, the day she walked into the culinary school. Uh, these are things that we never hear about. You know, the commercial media never spoke about these things. And uh, so I felt we needed this, uh, you know, this uh, kind of conversation to happen. To change this uh, and right now during the pandemic people are, st are sharing so many things you have chefs like maybe uh, you know vladimir from uh, moscow putting out his email uh, and his uh, uh, you know instagram handle for everybody to say call me with questions and you can ask me anything and the same story is with you know maybe an activist uh, from uh, brazil from the amazon who's 26 years old and, uh, you know, she has something to say about what's happening in her community. Uh, you know, so it's, it's like a big uh, gamut across the board of people that uh, we try to bring in to share their stories. Uh, and, you know, like if Margot shares her story, uh, you know, it can inspire somebody at a small level to start something within their own community. Uh, you know, every uh, initiative doesn't have to be like a headline making news. It can be something small. We need to give the proper uh, space and the voice to people, uh, you know, who open a restaurant in a community with 10, 15, 10 people, five people they employ, they buy locally, uh, you know, they uh, hire locally, uh, they give back to the community locally. So, and they're, you know, changing the way people eat with how, what they're cooking. They're making less desirable ingredients, more popular, uh, you know, kind of, uh, showing sustainable practices in a very small manner. So, the, you know, that's like a ripple effect. It spreads out. So that's what we are doing. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, because like all um, sharing those stories is inspirational. So this way we are changing the world if we are reading them and getting uh, inspired and taking some actions on our side. So the chefs are becoming the somehow the leaders, not only people who prepare food and inspire those who want to prepare the food, but also inspire us uh, through their personalities, through their life stories. So that's, that's very encouraging. Um, you've uh, mentioned sustainability, so I would like to to call out Antonia <laughs> on that because I know it's it's so important to you being close to the nature um, those things about being eco-friendly close to the nature sustainable they are very popular they're very trendy now but sometimes we might get the impression that those are the only the slogans it's good to say them it's good to have them on uh, some put somewhere but do we really care about where the food comes from how do we process it what we eat how we impact the 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 world with what we eat so please uh, share your views on that well, uh, it's, it's really um, a good slogan talking about sustainability. It's a good fashion for me and being green is not a bad thing, you know. I'm trying my best to do it uh, every day in a better way because I think it's like uh, a road and uh, I am really far from where I want to be. 
my my restaurant uh, as many others uh, uh, is not uh, sustainable uh, at all uh, even if I try every day not wasting things, uh, trying to do my best, uh, showing my, my cooks in the kitchen uh, how to prepare everything with uh, all the new techniques, uh, not to waste uh, everything. But it, it's really hard, I think, uh, and um, in modern times, uh, being uh, in the business uh, and, uh, you know, trying our best uh, to do, uh, to, to not to waste it's very difficult in fine dining but i think uh, um, we have to push you know every day and uh, i use uh, uh, herbs that are not rare at all uh, like weeds uh, and something that has no value at all in the market uh, something that you cannot buy sometimes uh, what you cannot buy what has no price in the market is uh, more um, has has more value for me uh, than caviar or uh, than gold and uh, this is something that i show every day even to my guests because i think uh, um, those people who come at my restaurant only eight table 20 20 seats uh, is nothing comparing to other restaurants all around the world but uh, Yes, I think uh, I think uh, showing how uh, precious can be an aubergine or a zucchini cooked uh, in a proper way, not wasting anything, is my way, you know, to do that. And uh, I kn I know it's not enough, but uh, I try. <laughs> As you mentioned, it's a very good slogan to be eco-friendly, to be sustainable. The only concern might be that some people might only put it uh, as you know as, as a slogan and then don't don't use it in an everyday life. But as you've said, it's quite hard to to be a fully sustainable restaurant, especially at some level. So let's hope that we all can find a way to uh, be more kind to our planet and still enjoy everything that we that we would like to see on our uh, tables. Margot, what do you think other people can do to, other chefs can do to, to be the world saviors if we are still with the topic, topic, can chefs save the world? What would you see as some other inspirations? Maybe you have other stories to share of, of anybody else or maybe you have some ideas that you would like to make uh, come true one day. I think it's very important that chefs um, share their stories and inspire each other that that we don't live on an island and um, and do our own thing and and being part of a, of a chef's community um, in a small village I think makes that almost easier like we've always been very connected as chefs in restaurants and even 15 20 years ago if you ran out of mushrooms you could run across the road and we would help each other um, and so I think for me also what's like a year ago I I called upon all the chefs in front hook and we sat around the table and I said if you know if I as a kind of one woman show with assistants can can wrestle up chefs from all over the world to cook for the children of French Hook. Can you imagine what we can do if we do things together? Um, but it obviously takes initiative, but it takes a lot of time and it takes somebody to lead that and everybody's wrapped up in their own world. And I think we have to take big lessons from this pandemic. I think for me, it's been, um, incredible how the community of chefs in French Hook uh, have come together, but also in, in neighboring towns in Stellenbosch and in Cape Town and how people have have, have got down to it and, and have cooked for the community and gathered for the community. Um, and, and, um, and we will continue that. You know, everybody's obviously slowly gone back to work um, and we've only just, our borders will be opening on the 1st of October, which um, we desperately need. A lot of places have closed. But it's been an incredible exercise in um, in caring. And in South Africa, we have a saying called Ubuntu, and it's really about empathy and sharing. Um, and and um, on my own, I'm actually nobody. I am because of you. And and I think that's been a a strong lesson. And I'm yeah, I feel very strongly about continuing that forward as as a movement. Um, 
and I think we can all do something. You know, you don't have to feed a thousand people. And I, I think Antonia is saying, oh, you know, it's very little. But it's not very little. We started making one muffin once a week for 70 children. And in those 70 children's life, we made a difference once a week. And, and I think if you look at the mountain, it's very big and it's very scary. And you almost want to give up because what difference is it going to make? But actually every step and every drop is making a difference and it's inspiring the people that work for you and the people that work with you. And, and I know every single chef that has worked in my kitchen that has somehow been part of Isabella, they're all extremely um, supportive still. They feel so proud that they've been part of that and that it's still continuing. So I don't think anything we do to save something or to make the world a better place is too little. You've mentioned that uh, we are still in a lockdown, in, at least uh, in terms of traveling. And uh, the fine dining is frequently about flying, traveling all over the world to the new places, tasting food. So it's not so much uh, sustainable as, as we might uh, think about it. Uh, it's not so eco-friendly. It's not so good for the planet, at least uh, from the perspective of traveling uh, by, by planes. Um, do you think, Emma, is there a solution uh, to that? Can still the fine dining be more sustainable, more eco-friendly with having this in mind that frequently we travel for food? Well, um, I've been thinking about that a lot lately, especially being stuck at home. Um, I've always traveled uh, very much and the last year or so I've been not really leaving the country at all. So. It's one of those things that are hard. I, I think in general that uh, traveling uh, is becoming like bigger and bigger for every year that that goes and, and, and chefs and all of us do travel more. I think it's hard to maybe not do it because I also see it as a positive view where you have a a chance and ability to travel to make a difference. Um, I wish there would be in the future maybe a better way where you could travel. I think uh, some of the things I've tried lately is not to just travel somewhere to do one thing. If I can combine different, um, different trips in one, uh, I'll definitely uh, try and do that. So most of the time I go abroad, it is for charity events or it is for um, helping out to fundraisers and things like that. And I'm trying to uh, balance the good towards the negative a little bit with it. But I think what I've learned a lot from the pandemic now as well is that it's not always a necess necessity to travel. You could... Uh, just looking at this panel today, where maybe they would have flown a lot of chefs to the other side of the world to be part in, in a panel discussion where you could actually do it online. Um, it's always hard to, to, um, to cook online and send that food along, but I think there's, there's need to be a balance to every travel uh, you make in the world. And I think they always say that um, three Michelin stars and so it's worth the travel, but you also hopefully got to see the positive that it brings to the country where people do travel into. The restaurant might be the one that attracts people to come visit, but they also learn and experience the rest of that culture. And I think that is something that is more important now than ever in the world to learn and see other cultures and see what is going around in the world and not just trust uh, the news. One of the biggest things I've always loved is to be able to go to other countries, uh, learn from the local culture and educate myself on how everyone in the world are living and coping and not just being a person who are stuck and seeing 
the world, the kind of world I've been living in coming from Sweden and now New York. So I think it is very important to, as a chef as well, to learn how other countries are dealing with uh, their economics and how they're dealing with farmers and local produce. And I think I've learned so much on my travels that I've brought back and implemented at the restaurant uh, that have been coming out of that. So I think there just have to be a balance on how you uh, how you travel in the future. Sure, this is one of the ideas. Yes, hopefully we can implement to to combine uh, our roots in the way that we are most efficient in being eco eco friendly. Talking about the changes we can make, but also about the changes that happened, uh, Gita, what are the biggest changes in the food food industry in chefs that you've observed in the last decade? What is changing uh, also in terms how chefs are changing the world? You know, chefs are changing themselves firstly. They, have, they are not the same chefs we used to see 10 years ago. Uh, they are, uh, you know, uh, more vocal and more active and more, you know, uh, 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 all the TV and, you know, uh, all these different uh, programs and conferences have also uh, kind of popularized, uh, uh, you know, a, a chef culture that is uh, kind of far removed from reality in some ways. Because one thing uh, uh, seems to get overlooked sometimes is that it's still all about cooking, you know? And when you are cooking, you're performing a service, which is like a transaction. You get paid for performing a service, and we tend to forget that part of it, and who's at the end of it are the customers. And, uh, you know, when Emma was talking about uh, the travel part of it, you know, uh, what we have come to realize during the pandemic is, and maybe it's going to, uh, you know, last till next year, who knows how long, is we need to be connected to our own communities first before connecting to the wider communities. Of course, all interaction is important, but right now, most uh, restaurants, even those that pivot to, you know, whether they are starred restaurants or on, the, on some list or whatever, uh, you know, they're doing takeout and they're trying to survive based on, you know, what is around them. Uh, you know, earlier with travels, 70% uh, sometimes of the, uh, customers or guests were coming from other parts of the world. That's no longer feasible. And, uh, you know, so we, we have uh, become aware of all, you know, how fragile our industry is right now. And that has got, uh, you know, chefs uh, talking about different things now, you know, and uh, with the pandemic, we have also exposed so many other issues in the industry. You know, we have the socioeconomic disparities, we have the racial inequalities. So far, we are only uh, hearing a lot about the gender imbalance, about the 50-50 and all that. But the fact is that people invest a lot, you know, when they go into the industry now. Earlier days, I mean, you people would uh, turn to cooking when there was no other choice. They couldn't do anything else. And now people go to culinary school, like, uh, you know, Emma, you went to culinary school. I don't know about you, Margot, but... Uh, it's uh, we invest a lot in that future so we need to put good use uh, uh, put it to good use uh, you know and when we talk about uh, you know uh, I find it amusing to hear the term that can chefs change the world I think firstly we need to change our own small communities before we can change the world because those little communities together make up the world you know it, it, you know we don't exist in a vacuum that's true also but at the same time, we need to deepen those connections, not just with producers. You know, sometimes when people talk about things like sustainability uh, and other thing, issues, it's like a word that's used. It's words not followed by action. So maybe the time has come. And this little break that we, are, uh, we have all gotten has given us time to reflect, you know, to think back of what's important, what's not important. You know, in my case, I got uh, this break uh, when I first got diagnosed with cancer. And I kind of, uh, you know, you come at a threshold in life where you, uh, you know, uh, go over what you value, what your, uh, you know, uh, your ethics are, uh, what you want to leave behind, uh, what you have uh, assimilated during all these years in the industry and what you can impart and share with others. And that's what prompted me to come up, you know, 
with salty, uh, which is like everybody, you know, discouraged me and said, oh, right now uh, magazines are folding up. Nobody is going to this business, but this is not a commercial magazine. This is a platform of sharing for the community. It's open to everybody across the board. So those are the kind of changes, uh, you know, that I have seen uh, happen in the world right now. You know, we have chefs like uh, maybe Jose Andres or Maso Vatura, you know, who are out to change the world in a big way. But then there are small chefs, uh, you know, not just chefs, everybody in the food industry, maybe bar owner, a cafe owner, you know, a street card vendor, you know, making little, uh, you know, packed meals to deliver to hospital workers. Or right now we have fires in California, delivering them to frontline workers. We never get, we never talk about those people, but they are there also. And not everybody looks uh, uh, for recognition or for fame. Some people do this because they feel it is the right thing to do. And, uh, you know, to do things like that, you sometimes have to stand apart from the crowd. And that takes a lot of courage. It's not easy, you know. And uh, when th that's when you need the support. And I feel like, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I do get the support in my initiative. I'm sure Marco gets a lot of support in the initiative. You know, Antonia does, uh, Emma does, you know, the city harvest, harvest uh, most chefs in New York are very active in it. Uh, you, you know, so we all need uh, that uh, little push behind us. And uh, at this point, being politically incorrect, you know, uh, I feel that women sometimes don't uh, step forward to help other women. You know, maybe women need to be a little more prominent in that field and, you know, kind of encourage some, something good that's happening. You know, we have to lose this mentality of uh, me and I. We have to start thinking in terms of we and us because uh, like Margot said, you know, you cannot do anything uh, on your own. You can start something, but you know, armies don't move. They're not one man or woman or one person armies, you know, but, uh, you need to have, you know, a strong support and a community behind you to push any kind of initiative. And I see that uh, forming in many different parts of the world. I feel the younger chefs, uh, firstly, they might get attracted to the industry in many cases because of the glamorization and all that, you know, being somebody. But then they also, rea you know, are, are realizing that you need to build a foundation first. You can't jump to that. Uh, you know, that rank or that step right away. And uh, one more thing that this uh, pandemic has exposed is, you know, the uh, system within our industry. It was at breaking point already. You know, we are not supporting, uh, you know, the, the workers who actually, uh, you know, do all the grunt work, all, all the hard labor. You know, there was wage discrimination. Uh, you know, medical, uh, 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 you know, uh, support, uh, all that was not available. Uh, you know, some parts of the world, uh, it's, uh, you know, you have uh, social medicine, you have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, different uh, government uh, benefits. But in the U.S., there is nothing. I mean, our industry employs 16 million people in the small independent businesses. They're all out of work right now. And uh, we didn't get any help from our government. Uh, what we got was very little. It's like you have a big gushing wound and you stick a little bandaid on it and say, oh, okay, that should fix it. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, it's also brought uh, up the fact that, uh, you know, chefs or people in the industry also need to have power, not just have a voice that they can go on the media and they can talk about different things. But then we need to have power to move the government. And for that, we have to work towards some kind of representation to do all those things. Mm -hmm. Sure, uh, like being together, speaking as we instead of uh, me, uh, it, it is much more powerful. So thank you for sharing your thought on that. Uh, You've mentioned a couple of times uh, the power of media. So I would like to ask uh, Antonia, what do you think that the impact of television can be of this positive kind? So is the media from also your personal uh, experience from the master chef can be a way for the chefs to transmit some positive message to, to really change anything? Well, uh, 
I think uh, uh, every day we are uh, quite responsible for the messages that we give to people, you know. It, it doesn't mean uh, um, that... Uh, it, it's not only the television. Every interview that we that we make every day, every uh, podcast that we that we have, uh, everything is uh, a message to the community. And uh, of course, uh, television uh, has more uh, powerful in terms uh, of numbers. But it doesn't mean that it is uh, the only way to communicate uh, uh, to a large uh, amount of people. Uh, I tried uh, um, using uh, a big uh, a big uh, television pro program to um, to uh, you know uh, tell the story about uh, our restaurant about our little little region in the northeast that was not so famous and uh, it increased uh, a lot uh, our business uh, and uh, it was really useful. But uh, at the end, uh, is like uh, Gita says, it's not only about me, you know, it's about uh, my region, it's about my ingredients, it's about uh, my producers. So every time we speak about our restaurant, it's not only about uh, us, it's not only about the chef. And uh, I think the lockdown also showed us uh, how how much we are all connected. We had uh, the the perception that uh, uh, we we could do everything. That uh, in one one day we could be in New York, and the day after we we could be back at our restaurant and everything was fine. But at the end, we are really connected uh, each other. Uh, all around the world, uh, but uh, at the end, we are really rooted uh, in our community. And uh, this is uh, something that is beautiful, uh, really powerful, something about modern times. Uh, and uh, I love the times that we are living, even uh, with the pandemic, you know. Being connected is such a, a great thing, being friendly with uh, and feeling that we are so uh, nearby, even we, if we are far. But in the end, we are also rooted and uh, we have to care about our country and about uh, our local uh, guests because, you know, they saved us at the end uh, of the day. Uh, my restaurant is still uh, fully booked now because of my local guests. And this is because uh, uh, I think I'm lucky because uh, I live uh, in Italy. I live in a rich region and in the heart of Europe. At the end, uh, it's only because I'm lucky. It's not something that I, that I you know, I, I didn't do anything for that. And so I have to care about uh, all those uh, uh, beautiful restaurants that are located in uh, a region that are not so uh, lucky as me, you know. We are connected in this way, even. <laughs> yes, we are connected. We are one, one community, one big community and a lot of small communities and we have to support each other. But I think that there is also one other community that we can think of, the, the diners themselves as, as a separate community within the community. And we'd like to ask Emma, do you think that uh, the diners have uh, more and more uh, impact on uh, the direction that chefs take uh, with their food or still there is uh, much to say in the hands of the chefs themselves? especially in the light of the of the situation that now we are focusing on the local communities not people that come and go fly in fly out but people who who, who we are surrounded with so how do you feel who has more impact on what we are serving now so this is this is something that i've always considered to be um you know when when you come up in, in the restaurant industry and you're a young chef and and i remember myself saying in the beginning of uh, my year so i was like this is my food, I'm cooking in my way, take it or leave it. Um, and I think the older you get and the more mature you get into your cooking experience and, and how you grow and evolve as a chef, you start realizing that um, it's a hospitality industry, right? And, and however much you always feel like you have this vision that you want to see it, you're still not cooking for yourself, you also are cooking for all the diners and all the people who, who are coming in and supporting your restaurant. And that doesn't mean that you shouldn't stay true to your vision, but you also have to learn to adapt and the future is coming really fast. And I think most 
uh, restaurateurs or chefs around the world can um, can say that that it's not easy being a chef anymore because you have uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago, people came in the door and they just ate what you cook, basically. Now it's um, food preferences and allergies and, and, and people are educating themselves, which is really uh, great and awesome to see that um, they're kind of pushing chefs even more forward to think about it. Like they are demanding where is your vegetables coming from? Where is the fish being sourced? Where is the meat coming from? Are you sustainable? And I think for many chefs that have opened up our eyes even more that it is something that is very, very important to, to consumers as well. So when it comes to how you cook and how you run your restaurants, you really have to take those aspects even more serious than, than ever nowadays. And especially with the community being more forward thinking into vegetables and, and sustainability, it's giving us a chance to pick up and evolve uh, maybe even faster than we would have done uh, on our own. And that is something that is, um, the last couple of years has been very much on my mind. I've, I've already, I've always thought about uh, a waste uh, and consumption and, um, and that I think plays a little bit role into as well, coming from Sweden into US where you can also see amount, the amount of food that you put out, like more isn't always better. Uh, and that's also one of those things where um, education comes in, in, in the younger generation. I think that is something that chefs nowadays have to uh, educate the younger cooks that comes along as well, that they have to look and they have to adapt to uh, their people that are eating you food as well. And it's not just about uh, me anymore. It's actually about uh, the whole community and the diners are the ones that we are um, are living for. And, and that's uh, going back to what was said earlier, we have zero tourism in New York as of the moment. So we have to depend on our uh, locals, which have even now uh, made us realize that we have to change around our cuisine a lot. Like um, chefs tasting menus at the restaurant at the moment is not sustainable. And that was one of the first things we decided not to come back with. We're, uh, we're running the restaurant as an a la carte restaurant with more uh, approachable dishes. And we see uh, an enormous amount of response to, to having that available, which makes you think uh, what the future will bring. Will, will the way of dining change forever? And I think um, you just have to be more of a listener to what the diners are expecting for you because they are the ones the local diners are the ones who are keeping us alive at the moment thank you for that you've tackled the aspect of what the future will bring so i would like to to ask you all what do you think should change in the chef's approach apart from already mentioned sustainability and uh, community appreciation to uh, to make the chefs be the world changers even if we by world me we mean this small community that they live in so the the, the world just right uh, next to them what do you think is the chef of the future what would be what would be the set of attributes of a good chef uh, from for for the next upcoming years if we say that the, we have to change we have to accommodate some things not only because of the pandemic but also because of the changing worlds margo um well i think there have been some uh, serious business lessons uh, in the last few uh, six months, certainly in South Africa. I think um, obviously tourism and uh, foreigners are a massive part of, of the economic infrastructure here. And, um, and even also I see it around me where shifts are turning down. Um, I, think, I think it's exactly what Emma is saying. Be in tune and 
Um, and, and, and instead of just being on this treadmill um, that just keeps going and going uh, and you're just thinking, what next must I do? What next can I do? How do I get recognized, especially in the top game of chefs? Um, to stop and listen. Um, I don't have a restaurant, but I've certainly learned to listen more in these past six months. Um, because, and again, it's, I think it ties in what Emma said. We think we know what people want because, you know, we are the experts um, and we do what we want to do. Um, but when we started feeding the community, the poor, hungry community, we knew it. It was a whole bunch of chefs. It was incredible. And we were getting lots of food donated and we were cooking and we were cooking for the community. We were making big pots of vegetable stew and making it super flavorful and packaging it individually because it was because of COVID. And then we had a meeting with a lot of the community leaders and they said, we'd actually like to cook our own food. Oh, so we went, oh, okay, like we won't, we won't take that personally. Um, so what we'll do is we'll prepare your food. We will chop everything and we'll cut and we'll do. And at the next meeting, I asked the question and said, are we doing okay? Are you happy with how everything is divided? So we linked in with 12 soup kitchens uh, and started supplying them on a daily basis. We, we knew and still know who's cooking when. And they said, well, maybe we could receive the vegetables a bit earlier so we can cut it smaller. So I said, okay, so we're not doing okay. We're cutting it too big. And it's basic stuff, but it's actually instead of thinking that we know what people want um we need to ask we need to stop and we need to listen and um and not take it as an offense um and it's it's the same i think between chefs we need to listen to each other more and um and translate that in whichever way you feel is right but uh, you know, the, 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 also again in the community, we are feeding people from different cultural backgrounds, but like very different cultural backgrounds. And me coming from a chef's background thought it's very boring if I give you maize meal one day, rice the next day, maize meal one day. So I bought in like, I don't know, instead of buying beautiful little carrots now, I buy the cheapest, biggest carrot that because we need to feed like 40,000 people every month. Um, and so I was buying in a ton of barley and a ton of dried wheat and, and the one community loved it from their cultural background. That's what they like to eat. But the other community was like, what are we supposed to do with this? And so again, I had to step back and go, I'm trying to add variation, but actually I need to listen. It's not what people want to eat. What's the point in providing that? And so, I'm talking on a very kind of ground ground level, but I think it's taught me a lot um, as a chef and how I will change when I cook um, on that professional level again. So we know that the chef of the future is a good listener who appreciates the community and uh, at least tries to be sustainable. Antonia, what would be other uh, attributes that you would think of for the chefs of the future? Well, uh, I think study, you know, studying is uh, such a great uh, opportunity that we have today uh, as a chef, you know, uh, challenging ourselves every day, not, uh, not, you know, only studying uh, great techniques and modern techniques, but studying our, uh, what is around us, because uh, sometimes uh, we look uh, far away from home and we really don't uh, look uh, out of the window of uh, our restaurants. I know this is something maybe not so original, but uh, it's uh, so useful because, you know, uh, after the lockdown, the first thing that I, that I, that I, the first travel that I made was uh, one hour by car alone through uh, through the woods to meet uh, um, a little producer of uh, goat cheese and uh, I didn't have the time to meet her until that moment and it was so important for our restaurant uh, we uh, we changed uh, uh, some way uh, in a really you know little way our um, our perception of, of uh, goat cheese 
and this is uh, something maybe little, but uh, for a restaurant like our, um, like ours, uh, it uh, it is important. And uh, so, I say um, maybe uh, look out the out, out the out the window the ingredients that are not so far from the restaurant, but also. Uh, trying to understand what uh, are the needs of the community that is uh, around the restaurant. Even, uh, you know, the, the meal that is not so far from the restaurant, uh, uh, or uh, for me, um, the vineyards that are just in front of the window. And uh, this is studying for me. This is uh, not only improving the quality of the restaurant, but is uh, this is uh, the real uh, studies that we have to make every day, you know, to improve uh, our job and, and uh, our our keep. I think. So I hear your answer in your answer not only studying but also building relationships as for one of the attributes of the, of the modern chef or the chef of the future. Gita, what would be your thoughts on the chefs of the future? I think one uh, thing that's going to become very important is health. You know, chefs, when they cook, when they source, uh, they're going to be very concerned about health because it's something that most consumers, most guests, uh, diners are very much into right now. And this little break that we are getting is giving us a lot of time to reflect on that. And then people are at home. I hear from chefs, uh, first time I've spent time home with my kids, uh, you know, spend so much time with my parents, uh, you know, school lunches, uh, things like food and hospitals. I mean, these are issues that, you know, sometimes I've been trying to bring them up for years, but nobody paid attention. And now I'm hearing back, uh, you know, that, uh, yes. So I feel like uh, health is going to be a big factor. I mean, and also when we speak about fine dining, uh, you know, we are going to change the kind of guests we are getting. Fine dining is still going to exist. But uh, you know, the kind of people who used to save for a year to go and eat at this one restaurant on their bucket list, uh, maybe that won't happen for a long time because economies are in disarray everywhere. People don't have expendable income. And what we are going to get is, uh, you know, maybe younger millenniums uh, who are maybe making, a, a, you know, a, a good, uh, a, a, you know, making like, like a killing in them, uh, you know, um, the media market or the, uh, you know, the uh, virtual information market or, you know, the mass sales like Amazon and all that, those will be the clients and they will not be uh, the ones who want to come and take a picture with the chef. These are guys who are going to be very demanding and kind of state what they exactly want. And, uh, you know, so there's going to be some kind of a road reversal. And we are also seeing that, uh, you know, the change in, uh, with this pivot to, uh, you know, the takeout and delivery, it's going to stay because I talk to chefs, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, three star or two star restaurant, they say, well, we are going to keep this as a backup because we don't know what will happen next. This probably like what we hear from the scientists is not the last pandemic, you know, but this is a change we are seeing the chef of the future. When did you ever hear of a chef, uh, you know, speak about the health of the soil? You know, how many chefs were speaking about uh, what kind of uh, fuel they use in the restaurant was going to impact the environment. You know, so it's, it's, it's going to be really changing pretty fast because, uh, you know, this awareness is hitting faster right now through this uh, time period. And, uh, you know, so we have to be cognizant of that and we have to start addressing that. Uh, you know, so we have to get more active in our, uh, you know, in our communities within our networks. You know, um, in the last few years with all the conferences and all these other things, uh, they, we were building good networks, which were more like media net networks. Now we need to build working community networks. It's, uh, you know, uh, like uh, right now, Beirut experienced that uh, horrific, uh, you know, the explosions. And there were chefs uh, asking me because we a few months ago uh, we had a, a, had a feature on the Sukal Tayeb, you know, which was working there. How can you connect me, Gita, to somebody there? I want to go and help there. I want to do this and I want to do that. And that's really, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's it's a wonderful th uh, thing, you know, that we are also thinking of our um, colleagues, our peers, you know. So it's like a, making a big family all together. Uh, to support and be there in times of need. 
you know, so I, I feel like the, the future is really going to be different. Uh, you know, and maybe also uh, we are going to, we have too many restaurants right now in some parts of the world to begin with. And uh, right now we're going to weed out a lot of that. There'll be a lot of uh, career changers who might decide that, oh my God, this is too tough. And I'd rather, you know, go into a nine to five job or something or do something other than that. I mean, those were the days when I switched from teaching in a university to coming to cook. It was not something that was looked upon you know, everybody was like, are you crazy? Are you nuts? I mean, everybody is upset with me. But now, uh, you know, people want to come in for different reasons. But I think those reasons are going to change why they want to come in. Maybe we'll have more young people come in who want to make a change than just, uh, you know, be on some uh, popular, uh, you know, uh, you know, TV series or, you know, be on the cover of magazines, etc. So, that's my take on what's going to, I feel is going to happen. You said that the world uh, of the fine dining and uh, the, the future of the chefs will, will change. Uh, it already has changed because of the pandemic. I'm thinking about the aspect uh, of the chefs uh, attending uh, seminars all over the world, flying from one place to another, of course, to, to listen, to learn, to share experiences. And I would like to um, ask whether you think is, is something that uh, is missing now and was very good or just the opposite now gives uh, the chefs the time to uh, discover more their kitchen, the, their, the cuisine that, that they are um, working on or have been uh, uh, working on for many years or discover something local. Emma, what do you think? Is, is, is traveling for seminars something that is lacking from your calendar or you cherish the moment that you can focus on what you've been doing for, you for some time? So I think it's very uh, different and it's very strange here in New York uh, as of the moment because uh, it's it's one of the cities that has really been um, shut down completely. So it, it's um, you definitely have the time to uh, reflect upon yourself, not um, barely hitting half of your work hours that you normally do. Um, so... I definitely miss uh, traveling uh, a lot, um, but it's also been very um, rewarding to be able to stay at home and, and take, uh, take a little bit of a moment to focus on what, what's in front of yourself. But um, it's, um, it's def definitely something I'm missing. I've been traveling my entire life uh, to experience the world and, and get, a, get an idea of, of what happens outside of my little bubble. So it's, uh, it's something that I've always valued to make me grow. So um, it's, it's been very challenging as well to be stuck at home and, and not being able to, to go anywhere. And, and in New York as well, we've been on a halfway lockdown. So there hasn't been anything um, that you could do uh, more than being home. So um, I think it's one of those those things that are maybe more suited for people who have family close by or, or have a family. I'm, I'm, my family is all back home in Sweden. So uh, I think it's mostly have been hard for me to be, be stuck here uh, on my own. Sure, th that is understandable f fully that if we are stopped from visiting uh, the, our family, our dearest, then the traveling gets a totally different meaning also in this private uh, life. Uh, I would like to ask each of you about the inspiration because we said that it's so, at the beginning of our discussion, that it's so important to find the inspiration in the chefs as well. Also, Gita, you've, you've mentioned that there's a lot of inspiration uh, on the pages of the Salty magazine, not from the people who are very famous or, or very big, but it's something that is important or, or very sweet even on a small scale. So I would like to ask each of you who you admire as a chef or as a personality and why? Why would you think that it, they, they are worth uh, going uh, their path or at least uh, taking something from their careers or from their way of thinking and applying it to your lives? 
maybe starting from Margot. Mm. Yeah, there's a lot of shifts I admire, but I think um, I think I really admire the people um, that worked in my kitchen, that were born in the village, just went to school and straight from school basically came to my kitchen um, and worked with me for 18, 20 years and, um, and was so incredibly loyal. Um, and I kind of broke their heart when I left. And so there's, um, there's one chef, her name is Jackie, and she's a couple of years younger than me. She has four children and she now has two grandchildren. Um, and she stayed on when I left and continued cooking and she learned a lot, uh, but never went to any kind of tertiary school. And, um, and she was retrenched after 28 years of service. And, um, and she's just started a new job um, in a tapas restaurant in our village. And she's heading up the kitchen. Um, and yeah, I think it's her that I, at this point, I really, I'm so proud of her as well. Um, but she's, she's doing it. And she's never been outside this village, you know. And, um, and so I think it's those kind of warriors that I admire. She's never been in an aeroplane, um, you know, and I, I, yeah, that's, I think that's where, where, where I get very inspired from that courage. Surely. Antonia, what would be your inspiration? Well, uh, I, it's really difficult to, to choose uh, one person and, um, uh, Today, every day is different for me, you know, every day you jump out of the bed really tired from the evening before and you have to push uh, during the day, every day to be better. For me, the day is like this, you know, every day. It's not a competition uh, against uh, uh, someone else, of course, it is uh, something that you have inside you that pushes you to be a better cook, a better person, maybe, and um, every day someone inspires me, something inspires me, and every day is a research, you know, uh, and this is something uh, really true for me. Uh, sometimes is a picture, sometimes is an artist, uh, sometimes is a story, and sometimes uh, is an article that you read in, in a newspaper. Today is, uh, is an article that I've read about uh, Elenda Ross uh, and about uh, uh, her uh, restaurants and uh, how was uh, her uh, lockdown. It was an interesting article uh, that I've read like uh, two hours ago, but uh, maybe Margot today during this, uh, uh, these talks, uh, you know, every, uh, every, every person uh, who tells and shares something beautiful um, helps uh, my creativity and uh, my day. This is uh, something that I love about uh, our job. <laughs> yeah, to be, to be constantly inspired. Um, yes, exactly. <laughs> Emma, what, be, what would be your inspiration? What is your inspiration? Well, I think as well, it, it's, you draw inspiration from so many different people. And uh, there's chefs all, all over the world that I look for different inspirations from. But I think um, someone that always inspires me really, really much is um, uh, a baker that I, I've had with me. Or oh, she's been coming and going throughout the years. I've been leading the kitchen. And... Um, her name is Farine, and uh, I think what inspires me with her is that her dedication and her kindness and the way um, she moves into the kitchen and just uh, makes everyone um, calm and happy. And uh, I keep telling myself every day at work that um, if I could be just like her, um the world would be a better place so i think when it when it comes to inspirations um i don't always look uh to people who are out there in the world i think uh just looking to a woman who are next to me who um makes my day at work 
um, happy. And uh, whenever I work next to her, I know it's going to be a, a good day. So uh, having her there and having her as my inspiration is uh, it's a, it's a big difference going to work every day. Thank you for sharing that. Gita, you've uh, talked to so many people uh, as for the Salty magazine. Who's your inspiration? You know, many of these people I've known for over 30 years. Uh, I'm very, always very inspired by Carmen Rusqueira in Spain because she was uh, the one person who changed my perception about, uh, you know, the women-only forums and things like that because I began to understand that they create more divisions than they bring people together because what we are fighting against, we are creating all over again, again with, you know, the discrimination. I'm also very uh, inspired by people like, say, Rudolfo Guzman in Chile, who put his country's cuisine on the map and he's, you know, against all odds. I mean, five times he was ready to give up and sell, but he did it. I'm inspired by people like Margot, who gave up something to give back in a real way. I mean, this is real action. This is not, uh, you know, um, you know, not uh, many of us like, in life, sometimes we think about when will be the right time to do a certain thing. You know, the right time is always now. You never know what tomorrow brings. We already seen that with the pandemic. I admire people, uh, you know, who have stuck in the industry for 30, 40 years, because this is a very tough business. It takes a lot of perseverance, uh, a real passion, uh, you know, to, uh, to carry on at, at this stage. You know, I admire people who, uh, you know, m migrants from other countries who come in and establish a food business in another part of the world. We have so many strikes against them. Uh, you know, I, I mean, uh, we have to uh, we have to really, uh, you know, look uh, around us sometimes. Uh, you know, I unfortunately had too many experiences with, say, hospital food or whatever. I, I see a chef in Spain who's uh, going out into the hospital kitchens, uh, you know, an echo uh, from Azur Mendy to teach, uh, you know, how to cook something that's more nutritious, uh, you know, more delicious and better looking than the gluttony stuff you usually get served. You know, I'm inspired by people who go and work at soup kitchens. Uh, you know, we have a huge homelessness problem here in uh, LA. Uh, you know, these are not people who are known in the media who have big names or whatever but they are doing something. So for, for me, anybody who actually does something, it doesn't have to be a, you know, a very big thing that makes all the headlines, but who does something is, uh, is an inspiration. You know, whenever you fight the odds to, for something you believe in, you inspire many others to follow you. That's what I, I think. And this way, the chefs can save the, the world, can save the day for, for, for the people. I really like the outcome of this conversation. I really like uh, those different uh, backgrounds and stories you shared with us and your inspirations, because this is showing us what can be the chef of the future, the chef that is changing the world, the person who is very open-minded, keen to study, keen to build relationships and is listening to its uh, community, the chef who is appreciating many people, not the big names because it's easy to be um, to be starstruck with with a big name with a big chef who who has the uh, who had a great career but it's uh, I think even bigger thing to appreciate somebody just next to us who doesn't have a big name but has a big heart and does something really crucial for the community or for this small world that we are surrounded by thank you very much ladies for joining us for this discussion I hope this will be inspirational to all of those who are, who are listening and watching us and uh, that this discussion also changed their little worlds and i would like to invite all our listeners for a 15 minutes coffee break